think what I'm going to do is turn this thing off, don't you? Okay. Today is the 20th of February, 2010. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum and Veterans Research Center in Saratoga Springs, New York. Uh, today we are with Mr. Walsh here in Castleton, New York. And sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and date and place of birth, please? Uh, my name is Donald Alfred Walsh. Uh, I am 87 years old, and I was born in November 23rd, 1922, in Mount Vernon, New York. Did you attend school in Mount Vernon? No. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I attended school up until about the fourth grade. And then we moved into uh, Putnam Valley, New York, and we, I went to a one-room schoolhouse that had uh, six grades and about 30 students in six grades, mm -hmm. and I was in the fifth grade at the time, I believe. Then we moved, we went to school in Peekskill, New York, uh, through uh, high school, mm -hmm. and after high school, I went to, uh, was then New York State College for Teachers, which is now SUNY, mm -hmm. and uh, I was there until uh, my sophomore year, uh, then we had Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Do you remember uh, what your reaction was when you heard about it, and where exactly were you at the time? And I can't remember where I was, but I remember sitting in the assembly, mm -hmm. uh, listening to uh, President Roosevelt give his speech about the Day of Infamy, mm -hmm. and all of our students were at at that uh, ceremony, uh, at that uh, 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 assembly mm -hmm. meeting, and uh, on the stage was the radio, and uh, of which we heard uh, the president give this speech. And of course, we all realized that uh, <coughs> our time was going to come mm -hmm. to go in the military. Now, were you drafted, or were you? No, I wasn't drafted. Uh, what happened was uh, the. Uh, it was announced to us that if we joined up uh, right away, this, the military would let us finish the semester. Mm -hmm. And so we all joined up uh, to finish the semester, and uh, then we were called up. Now, how much college did you have at that point? About uh, two and a half, one and a half years. All right. One and a half years. Where did they send you for your basic training? Uh, basic training was at uh, Camp Upton in Long Island, mm -hmm. and uh, after that we went to Florida, uh, Miami Beach, uh, and uh, after that. Now, did did you uh, sign up for the Air Corps? No, I don't think I signed up for the Air Corps. I think what happened is they gave us intelligent tests, mm -hmm. and I think if you met a certain criteria, you automatically went into the Air Force. And that's the best I can remember. What was basic training like for you down in Florida? Well, it was a lot of marching, mm -hmm. and uh, we were a lot of us went together from the same college, you know, mm -hmm. and it was kind of interesting. Were you quartered at one of the hotels? Yes, right on the beach, in the Collins Avenue. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> and uh, once you completed your basic training. Mm -hmm. All right. When uh, when you completed your basic training, where did you go next? Um, I went to weather school mm -hmm. I, uh, to become a weather observer, and that was in uh, Chinook Field, Illinois, I believe it was. And um, at that time, uh, the Air Force was taking uh, a lot of losses, and somehow a, a notice came out. Mm -hmm. that uh, if you join the Air Force, uh, I don't know, I, if they gave us a three-day pass, I have no idea. Uh -huh. I can't remember, but I felt I ought to join the Air Force. So I uh, joined uh, the flying part, uh -huh. the Aviation Cadet Program. And uh, then they gave us a choice as to what you wanted to be, a pilot, a navigator, or a bombardier. And uh, I chose navigation because I thought I knew something about math. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know if I could handle an airplane at my size. At that time, I weighed about 127 pounds. And I went to um, San Marcos 
in Texas mm -hmm. uh, to uh, navigation school. Did, was, did you find that school difficult? Not particularly. It was, mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, I, I felt uh, it was easy to do from uh -huh. a navigational point of view, but it was hours and hours of, you know, school. Sometimes classes started at um, oh, 7 o'clock in the morning and end at 9 o'clock at night because you were doing uh, uh, the stars, you know, navigation. The celestial. Stars, the celestial navigation. Mm -hmm. yeah, but other than that, it wasn't that bad. Now, what kind of aircraft did you go up on? I, uh, I was assigned to uh, first combat cargo, mm -hmm. which was uh, C-47s, uh, air transport uh, concept, and uh, later on, Sometime later, I flew in the 46s, which was not very pleasant. Mm -hmm. Now, once you graduated from the navigation school, mm -hmm. were you commissioned as an officer? Yes, second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Okay, what happened next? Um, after my graduation, I mean, mm -hmm. then I went to uh, Missouri to, to meet my crew. In other words, the Crews are generally travel uh, the pilot, the co-pilot, flight engineer, and radio mm -hmm. man were training together, <coughs> and I was the last person to come aboard as a mm -hmm. navigator. And I remember being at um, at uh, can't remember where it was. I picked up that crew, but uh, I knew that uh, I was in the barracks and across the parade ground. I was told that the crew was across the parade grounds and I should mm -hmm. go over to meet them. And so I walked across the parade ground and went in and saw those fellows, the pilot and, and co-pilot were um, flight officers. Mm -hmm. And the uh, navigator, I mean the uh, radio man and the uh, chief, uh, flight engineer were sergeants. And it was kind of sort of unusual since I outranked them on the ground. Oh. <clears throat> But they outranked me in the air, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was kind of unusual. But they s saw me, and they were all big fellows. They were from uh, Tennessee, I believe, mm -hmm. all of them. And uh, they looked at me, and they said, "And I'm the fellow that's going to take them across the ocean." Uh -huh. You know, this little guy. And so uh, they said, uh, "Lieutenant, what we do on this crew is we take a fifth of a Hiram Walker." He said, and we all take a drink. And he said, when it gets around to the fifth man, that bottle's got to be empty. Now, <laughs> being a college student on a limited budget, the most I ever drank was two beers. Uh -huh. And uh, so uh, I, they held the bottle up and they said, that's your portion, <laughs> which was like a water glass full of uh, whiskey. Uh -huh. Well, I wanted to be a part of the crew, so I drank all the way down, and it went down just like water and everything, and then went around to the other fellows and they emptied the bottle. And uh, then I said, I'll see you. <laughs> and I knew they were watching me, uh -huh. but I just knew, just kept my eye on that chimney of the barracks that I was going to be on and just kept walking straight, watching that chimney and watching that chimney till I got to the my barracks, I got to the bed, flopped down on it. I don't think I woke up for about 20 hours. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you have any additional training before you went overseas with the group? I can't think of any. Mm -hmm. uh, what they did is they just said, this is where you're going. Mm -hmm. And our first uh, mission, uh, first flight was uh, to Flor Florida. I think it was Miami. And after that, we uh, the next destination was uh, One of the islands in the Caribbean, I can't think of the name of it, Bean. I think it was Bean on the airway. I don't know where that is, but mm -hmm. what island it was on, but that's what it was at that time. Okay. And then we flew from there to Trinidad. Now, were you flying a brand new airplane that would be delivered overseas? I, it was new. Mm -hmm. It had a, the thing that was unusual about it from our point of view, it had a special radar set uh, underneath the fuselage. It looked like a, a gun turret, mm -hmm. but it was a radar set, and we got it overseas, and I don't know why it was on the plane, because as soon as we got over to our base, 
they took it off. Now this was a C-47? C-47. And where did you land overseas? Well, first we we landed in India. Of course, we went, we flew down to Brazil, mm -hmm. then we flew across to Ascension Island. I don't know if we're, it's right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's, uh, that's a nice navigational problem to find this little square of an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And then we flew to, I, think, I can't think of, it was on the Gold Coast, the Ivory Coast in Africa. Mm -hmm. And we flew across Africa to, um, we skirted Arabia and ended up in, um, in uh, India. Mm -hmm. And then we went from India, across India, uh, to, to the western part of India, which was called Assam. I think it's still a part of India, it might be pra uh, Pakistan now, I don't know. But that's where our, our operational base was, mm -hmm. in Assam. Now how long did it take you? Uh, from start to finish to get over there, approximately was it a week or it might have been two weeks because we stayed a couple of days at different places. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any problems with the plane going across? Um, no, not really. We had, you know, of course, you had auxiliary um, gasoline tanks mm -hmm. in the in the fuselage. You know, huge. They were probably 20 inches diameter and then probably 10 feet long. Mm -hmm. and, and they were cardboard, and it was rather strange. Of course, I remember putting my hand on one like that, you know, and, and my hand went in, you know, it buckled the cardboard, stayed away from that, but that was our auxiliary gas to go over. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, did you go over as a single plane, or were there yeah, other planes? Plane. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a navigational interest. Mm -hmm. Now, where did you end up? Where were you uh, based out of it? When, when in, you... China, uh, in, in, uh, in India, mm -hmm. it was a place called Doazari. I don't know where it was, but it was not many, uh, uh, near the Burmese border. Mm -hmm. And then we were assigned to the British 14th Army. And we were kind of loaned to them. And, and uh, the British 14th Army, um, had a panzer movement, and what they did is they went from the eastern part, the western part of Burma, mm -hmm. across the central part, and cut the Japanese line between uh, Rangoon and uh, I'm trying to think of the major Mandalay. Okay. Between Mandalay and Rangoon, they cut the Japanese line in mm -hmm. half. And what happened is Japanese came down and surrounded the force. And so it was like a little bastone. Uh -huh. You see? And what we were doing is flying in uh, to uh, give them the support so they can get enough um, men in and enough ammunition to break out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, now, were you landing in there or, oh, or yes. dropping? Uh... No, we, we were landing, and um, I'm trying to think. There was a time that we were not. Uh, we were we were dropping, mm -hmm. and uh, I think first we dropped. Of course, I remember going around, and it was like on a merry-go-round. There were like 20 planes in a row, each one dropping, mm -hmm. and we'd go in low, and so low that you could, uh, I could see the fellows down in the foxholes, you know, uh -huh. looking up at us. And um, we'd go over, around, and every time we made a pass we'd, over the, our, our lines, then we would, you know, throw things out. Mm -hmm. And we'd, so half of the circle was half over the Japanese lines and half over uh, the American lines, you know. Were you taking fire from the oh, Japanese? Yes, yes, and we lost, I don't know, uh, 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 we had about twenty some planes. I think seven or eight were hit, but not knocked down. Were were they American planes or British planes? Well, they were American planes, but we had a fighter escort with uh, Spitfires, mm -hmm. and, and and this they they weren't following us, but they had a zone in front, you know, that they patrolled between us and where the Japanese would come from. Mm -hmm.
And yeah. then, one of the things that was interesting is after we we got the field, you see, and, mm -hmm. and, and we could go in and land. And, and what would happen is the uh, the British held the field in the daytime, and the Japanese held the field at night, the runway. Mm -hmm. And what would happen is the Japanese would come down at night and mine the runway, you see. And then uh, we would be loading up where we were when it was dark and mm -hmm. in the hands of the Japanese. And uh, we would fly to that field in time for the British to retake the field and get the mines out of the runway. Mm -hmm. Then we would come in and land. Now, I meant, to, I meant to ask you earlier, when did you go overseas? What year and in what month? It was in March, I think, of, uh, that would have been, what was that, 44, wasn't it? I'm trying to think. Uh, let's see. No, it must have been 45, because I wasn't overseas for it all. Okay. It must have been 45. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, you, uh, you were discharged in August of 45, right after the end of the war. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what kind of quarters did you have? What was your living conditions yeah. like? Well, in, in, in uh, Doha's area, mm -hmm. uh, we lived in bashes, they called them. And bashes were bamboo buildings. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting about them was, uh, was that the termites were in the in the uh, bamboo, and so when you make your bed in the morning, and you come back at night, there'll be all dust over the bed because of the droppings, you know, in the, uh, oh, okay. the, the thing. And of course, you had to worry about making sure your shoes were empty. So they always worried about scorpions, you know, mm. getting in your shoes at night. So you mm -hmm. leave them open and make you get out of them. Anyone get bit by scorpions or? Know. Okay. The, what about snakes? Any problems no, with them? No snakes problem. We, we, we were pretty well confined to mm -hmm. our little area, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it was, uh, the, the unusual part about that was that it was so hot, of course, that there was a, the mess hall was one place where, and where you ate, and then the other place was where they cooked. And so you got your tray and you went over and got where they cooked. And then you walked about 20 or 30 feet to, to this cover, uh, your under, uh, your undercover, mm -hmm. uh, where you would sit down and eat. And the spam seemed to be the thing for everything all the time. <laughs> but anyway, when you were walking that 20 feet or so, you had to watch out because up on the roof were these uh, vultures. They're big birds, like turkeys, you know, big uh -huh. turkeys. And and they would fly down and try to take th the food from your from your tray. tray. You know. <laughs> That's kind of funny. I never saw anybody taking it, but they, I saw them fly down low. Mm -hmm. you know. Now, what about tropical diseases? Any problems with, oh, with that? We had, everybody had what we called the creeping crud, you know. It was, uh, it was in your crotch or something, on your stomach and things like that, you know. And uh, I still go to the dermatologist for uh, skin problems, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the other thing is that uh, one time, I don't know what it was, but I guess it was in China, when uh, we were going up and, uh, and you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't say, hey, my ears hurt me, let's stop this. Mm -hmm. But I kept going up and my eardrum broke, you know, because of the training. And, and that bothered me for quite a few years after mm -hmm. the war, but it's no problem now. Mm -hmm. So you can hear all right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It was the cold that bothered me. Mm -hmm. You see, when you go out in the cold weather, that cold air got in that ear. Boy, sure. It was painful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereabouts did you go after uh, you were at that, at well, that one base? What happened was that uh, I got called into the uh, commanding officer uh, at, down in, the, in Burma. Mm -hmm. What happened uh, shortly after I left, the, the Brit just before I left, the British had control now mm -hmm. of, uh, it was called McTeela, where that air base was. And, um, and the Japanese were retreating southward. And uh, the, the war in Burma was practically over. 
because after I left there, they had a parachute drop uh, into Rangoon, but I, it was my understanding that Rangoon had already been abandoned by the Japanese. Mm -hmm. So the Burma campaign was over. And, uh, but before that happened, I was called into the commanding officer, and apparently they, the combat cargo had no, I don't, what do they call a table of organization for navigators. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any. And so the fellows up in China, they had no navigators, and apparently um, they had some terrific winds uh, and violent weather up there, and they, they took a lot of losses. I don't know, 10 or 12 planes went down mm -hmm. uh, because they went out, you know, and coming back they all ran out of gas because they didn't understand the headwinds mm -hmm. that was holding them up, you know. So they said, you know, go up to China. So we transferred up to China. I was in the 10th Air Force, I think, in Burma, but I was in the 14th Air Force up in China. Mm -hmm. And we flew uh, missions there. Now, whereabouts in China were you based on? I was based at a place called Chengdu. Uh, it's a big city now, I guess, mm -hmm. in Chengdu, China. Were your living conditions similar to? Oh, they were better. Mm -hmm. First of all, the temperature was, I think I got there around March, it was cold, mm -hmm. but not, uh, you know, it was cold because it was freezing uh, on the wings and the planes. But um, we had uh, solid buildings. I don't know, it was like, uh, it must have been buildings that were used uh, prior to the war, mm -hmm. some things. And we had um, uh, each set, uh, uh, I lived in a place was like a, a square mm -hmm. with uh, all around us, you know, uh, of uh, quarters. And uh, we, we didn't have, for example, a, a shower. A shower was a bucket that was tied to a tree, mm -hmm. and what you do, you let it down. They had hot water somewhere. We were guests of the Chinese, so they provided the water, I believe, and we get a hot bucket of water, put it into that bucket, lift it up uh, on the tree, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, what, get yourself all wet. Soap yourself down, open the open, of course, and then it, turn the, wa the water back on and wash yourself off, and that's, that was the way you got a shower. Mm -hmm. Now, were your quarters uh, strictly officer or were you? Strictly officers, yes. Okay. Yeah, all officers. All right. And uh, was your unit ever under direct attack by the Japanese bombing or? No. Okay. Never was. Um, hey. Way back from uh, Japanese lines. Okay. And what, were your aircraft ever under attack? Not up in China. Okay. Uh, at one time down in Burma. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fighter. But uh, other than that, uh, no, the Japanese Air Force was way back. Mm -hmm. We were like uh, 200 yards, 200 miles back from uh, where, the, where the Japanese and Chinese were fighting. Mm -hmm. And um, we flew up to the place that was close to where the Japanese were, a place called Sion. And, and that's where they found those uh, that army of clay soldiers. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. And we flew up to Sion, and um, it, it, it time came that uh, the Japanese were advancing on on the, on the Chinese, and uh, we flew up to Sion to with the, brought up um, with some naval forces, four or five fellows from the navy. Mm -hmm. And they, they knew demolition, and their job was to blow up the airfield before the Japanese could take it. And so we flew in, and with the last flame, plane out of Sion, what we did, they set the charges, uh -huh. and, uh, and uh, that was a little nervous then, because they said the Japanese cavalry was just over those hills, you know, and we were kind of glad to get out. But we flew the last plane out, and, and the charges went off, and the field was blown. Burned all the warehouses that were there, and the, the Japanese didn't take the field for about five days later. Wow. <laughs> now, what were you carrying most of the time for cargo? Well, down in, um, in Burma, 
we carried, uh, we, we, oh, uh, one of the things I forgot to tell you is when we were down in Burma, we were supporting the Mars Task Force. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Sure. Well, uh, they, we were doing that too as well uh, before Nick Teal, mm -hmm. uh, before that, uh, they took that field. Mm -hmm. But we would, uh, we would go down there and we would drop, uh, a, uh, and we were supplying some British forces too. So uh, in, in with airdrops, and what we did is, you, we had free falls, which were bags of rice in triple bags, mm -hmm. you know, like burlap bags. They're only about so big; they weighed about fifty pounds, but uh, they were very loose, so that when they hit the ground, they would kind of roll, and, mm -hmm. the, and the rice wouldn't come out, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so we would drop rice, and we would drop ammunition. And one time, we must have been supporting the British because we didn't know who we were supporting, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We just told you this is the coordinates that you would go at. And what the coordinates were, we had uh, panels. One side was yellow, and the other side was uh, green, uh, blue. And uh, there was a code for where to drop. In other words, uh, the northeast panel would be turned with the the whole base would be red, uh, blue, mm -hmm. and the and the yellow would be turned up on the northeast corner that time. And another time it would be another way. And, and the reason they did that is because the Japanese would put panels down. Mm -hmm. And we want to drop to them. Oh, yeah. See, folks? And so, uh, but my job was to sit in the Astrodome. And when you fly down, we drop at uh, 900 feet for uh, uh, parachute drops. Mm -hmm. and. Three falls were three, four hundred feet. You know. mm -hmm. But you would go down when, you, when when they went down like that, and then come up. I would be sitting in the ast standing in the astrodome, and I'd be looking straight down at the ground like that. You see, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so uh, I would check to make sure the parachutes open when the parachute drops. And uh, so uh, I, they pushed this out. We had pushers. These were uh, Indian, and we had this very, very mechanical method of, of, of uh, getting things out of the door of the trap plane. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the uh, Indian lay on his back and by the door and put his feet up like this, and then two of them hold him so he wouldn't go out the door. Mm -hmm. And when it came time to, uh, to, to push, you know, he'd the pilot would put the light on, you know, and, and he'd push out. And that's the way uh, we got rid of the stuff, very modern. <laughs> but anyway, um, I saw one parachute didn't open. And we went back to the same area the next day to uh, drop again. Mm -hmm. And there were parachutes in this field that were spelled out, R-U-M. Apparently, they were, we had uh, five gallon tins of uh, rum, <laughs> and there were four of them. That was uh -huh. 20 gallons of rum, and apparently the parachute didn't open. And oh, and it's, so that's so we broke. Had, we, had, <laughs> we had to come back and bring uh, the rum uh -huh. to them. So they, they must have been British, I guess, yeah. because we never did that. Hmm. But uh, that was interesting. Now, did you ever move troops around at all? I'm trying to remember. I know uh, we uh, didn't. We we moved Chinese. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. We had uh, interviewed a, a fellow over, that uh, was over there at the same time you were. Mm -hmm. Said they uh, they would move Chinese troops around occasionally, mm -hmm. and he says on occasion one or two of them they they'd lose them. They. They'd fall out of the aircraft, or really? well, <laughs> what? What happened uh, from uh, from our plan, uh, time when I was at the field? I don't think I was. In, it wasn't my day to fly, mm -hmm. so I was just there. And uh, apparently, this plane loaded with uh, Chinese troops uh, was going down the runway, and the pilot behind him yelled at him. Okay, his elevator lock was on. You know what it, it Yes. Is. So the plane couldn't take off. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently the flight crew didn't go around and check before it took off. And we have big tra uh, tank traps 
around the runway, you steep down and steep up. You know? mm -hmm. Well, that plane went into that track and up on end, and everybody was burned. Mm. You know, just burned up. Now, did you ever carry drums of gasoline inside? Always. Carry drums. I got to tell you that one. Um, for some reason or other, I always sat at my desk, you know, mm -hmm. and for, I don't know what happened, but we, we had stretchers in the back of the plane to take mm -hmm. out wounded, and I went back there, it was a milk run, you know, this particular flight, we were carrying you know, about six drums of gasoline, mm -hmm. And the, the doors are open on our plane. We never flew with the, uh, the door open uh, or closed in the, on ours. We just took them out. Mm -hmm. There were always open doors. And, uh, and you know, the flames from those uh, nacelles, you know, beautiful blue flames on each side mm -hmm. uh, going down as you're flying. And uh, <clears throat> so I was back there taking a nap. And uh, suddenly I was on the ceiling pushing myself off of the ceiling. And then after a while I was slammed down into the into the stretcher and with like pressure on me, you know, on the and then there was the whole plane was uh, you ever hear of what do they call it? Haley's uh, I don't know, some I can't think of the name of it. And Salmos or something. Oh Saint Elmo's fire. Saint Elmo's fire. Mm -hmm. All around the plane. You see, and and like thousands, it's like in a tin can. You're in a tin can with thousands and thousands of things hitting you all over. You know, mm -hmm. and it was uh, was um, hailstones. You see, what had happened, uh, and we broke out in the clear. Mm -hmm. And what had happened, the, I went to see what happened to the pilot. You know, and everything. What happened? We'd gone to a thunderhead, a cumulonimbus. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to know which way we went, but the plane went suddenly up. The pilot was pushing the engine straight down, mm -hmm. and we were going up at 4,000 feet a minute. That was this. That's what the uh, indicator needed to do. That's as far as as fast as the indicator. Uh -huh. right? And then after a while, we must have gone through the upside. And we're still going forward, of course, but not. Uh, then we went down at 4,000 feet a minute. Mm. You see, and on the meantime, uh, all is saying almost fire, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 then um, the gasoline drums broke loose from their moorings, you know, and and they were just tied down, and the f floating around. If I hadn't been in that stretcher, I'd have been crushed by 55 gallon drums, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and and a big section of the floor came out. Uh, you know, when, it, when the drum hit it and it flew up, and, and the windows went out and everything. And then, so we came out of the clear, and the gasoline was leaking from, you know, because uh, they turned upside down and stuff. And so the crew chief and the, and the radio man and I kind of get those drums set up straight, you know, and lash down again. And uh, that's when we went home. You know, with the gasoline running down mm -hmm. and those narcells, <laughs> it's kind of worrisome. Sure. But uh, we worked out. Now, what type of aircraft were you flying then? Was that still the 47s? Yeah, or? 40, yeah, C 47s. Mm -hmm. right. And when did you uh, switch over to the 46s? Well, um, I didn't fly many missiles in 46s, but uh, we all thought they were great mm -hmm. because uh, 47s. Had 1,800 horsepower engines and 40, uh, 46s had um, uh, let's see 47s had 1,200 and 46s had 1,800 horsepower so they could mm -hmm. hold their altitude if they lost an engine mm -hmm. but 47s couldn't if we loaded you know mm -hmm. and so um, uh, we, we look forward to it and I had a big desk in the back mm -hmm. compared to the little desk I had you know. It was really nice setup. Now, did you always fly with the same crew? No, I. They flew uh, about every third or fourth day, mm -hmm. and I flew every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I flew. Uh, uh, that's why I wasn't overlong. I flew like 20 days straight mm -hmm. one time. You 
because they didn't have navigators. You see. And so uh, every time the plane went up, I went up. And so anyway, um, the um, I flew in that 47, 46, and we had about five of them. But they don't tell you anything, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You learn about these things later because next thing you know, we only have uh, one, one missing. Don't know what happened to that 47, uh, 46. And um, a few days later, another one's missing. And then we lost about three in about four or five days. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know what it was. And they sent someone over who was uh, from, I think Curtis made those. And uh, they flew somebody over to check it, what it was. Well, in the C-47, the gas lines were welded. In the C-46, they were screwed. You know, the connections were screwed. Mm -hmm. And apparently, in the vibration of the engine, the gas leaked in the gas lines. And, and there was a firewall, of course, there. And the, the gas fumes uh, collected in front of the firewall, couldn't get out. And then she blew. Yeah. That was the end of that plane. So a fellow from uh, Curtis came over, and they drilled holes in the firewalls. Mm -hmm. Didn't have any problems after that. But uh, but they, we lost at least three. I never flew, but I think I flew about seven missions mm -hmm. in that C-47. C-47. But uh, most of the missions were 40, no, uh, 46. I didn't like to fly in that beautiful big plane. Mm -hmm. But there, I didn't see too many missions after that. But I flew so many days uh, when other people didn't, you know, be, mm -hmm. the, when we got new navigators, and we had, you know, some navigators come in to join uh, the organization. And uh, I had flown over 200 missions. And uh, I think I went in, I weighed 127 pounds. On my way out, I put my with my GI boots on the scale, I weighed 97. Wow. Uh, now, <clears throat> was there a limit on missions you would fly before they'd send you home? <coughs> I know there was in Europe. Yes, it wasn't the missions, it was hours. Mm -hmm. uh, how many hours you flew in the combat zone. And uh, I didn't know for sure. But uh, I look at, on the board at headquarters, they tell you the hours you have. And I see the pilots have 200 hours, 150, mm -hmm. 250 hours and everything. I had 900 and some. And so at that time, they sent me home mm -hmm. for uh, 40 days, rest and recuperation, and then I have to come back and do it again. Now, the planes you were flying, were any of them named at all? Do they have any kind of nose art or anything like that? Names painted on the side of them? No, we didn't have any. I'm no. thinking of no. no. But um, the the planes that we had were, you know, were so far uh, east of uh, uh, of where you could get supplies. Mm -hmm. You know, gasoline, for example, was. I think it took nine gallons of gasoline to get us one to to fly. And you know, by the time it flew it flew it in. Mm -hmm. But uh, and aircraft parts were hard to get. The, the, the engine, uh, the plane I flew in quite often had uh, 950 hours on the engines, and you're supposed to change engines every 500 hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so many landings on those uh, tires that was ridiculous. We we never changed tires. You know what I mean? It just mm -hmm. didn't. And the one plane I remember, put the crew chief putting his hand out like that, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that was oil dripping from the engine, you know, and we lost about 40 quarts of oil on every mission because, I don't know, they didn't replace the engines, I guess, mm -hmm. and underneath the plane was a, like tar, that was where the, where the uh, oil just slid land. back under the plane. We used to land on dirt strips, you know, mm -hmm. and and so the dust and sure. And, that, and we used to we used to have uh, each engine had two magnetos, I think, for safety, and uh, we had one uh, magneto going on, on the engine, you know, because you didn't have replacements. Mm -hmm. 
And um, well, the hydraulic system. Okay. Uh, the hydraulic system mm -hmm. was used to let the wheels down, you know, and it leaked so often that uh, we had to put canteen water. There was a, a little outlet there where you could, and I, I didn't do it, but they told me that some of the guys had to urinate. Uh, I, I've heard that story to before. Get the, yes, get the hydraulic system down. You know. mm -hmm. And, uh, but about General Chenault, i got to tell you, uh, we had this flight to take some, I don't know where it was, but it was where General Chenault was going to go be, mm -hmm. and it was uh, a, a milk can full of ice cream, and it was packed with ice, and around, you know, ice cream. Now, uh, we never heard of ice cream where we were, <laughs> it's ridiculous, you know. But anyway, we flew out and started to take off, and for some reason or other, the pilot had an accident, that, you know, the engines didn't go or something, he had to turn around and back to base. We got back to base and uh, everybody was lined up with their canteen things. That They came to rescue that ice cream, but it was gone before anybody could get it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, I, I like to tell you, uh, there was a place we flew uh, to get uh, some supplies and um, so I went there and I had a jeep and I went down to the square to buy some, uh, see what I could buy? Mm -hmm. And they had watermelons for sale there. So I bought uh, oh, five or six watermelons and put them on the plane and bring them back. They were about that big, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got back there, see, everybody saw me. So, Lieutenant, could I have one of those watermelons? So I gave it, the watermelons away, you know. And so I went up there again. This time I had a jeep and I loaded up with about 25 watermelons, put them in the plane, and uh, when, when we went up, the watermelons all went to the back of the plane, and the pilot was, you know, trimming her up to, to get going. So I got back to the base and I had these watermelons, and uh, I couldn't get rid of them. Nobody wanted the watermelon. I had about. 12 or 15 watermelons I couldn't get rid of. So I put them in my uh, 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 my quarters, you know, laid them in and everything. And <clears throat> so uh, I wake up in the morning and there's a big hole in one of the watermelons. The rats got it, you know. And uh, we, 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 we were, had a lot of rats. We lived surrounded by uh, uh, rice fields. Mm -hmm. And there were rats and also Malaria. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so anyway, um, so uh, I had to throw that watermelon away, and then go to bed. The next morning, got another hole in there. Uh, the rat ate that other watermelon, and so what I did is <clears throat> I uh, got a, a, a trap, you know, from the supply, and uh, I caught a couple of big fat rats and everything, and my my uh, watermelons were now gone. I got rid of them, and uh, so uh, no problem. And uh, so a couple of days later, I noticed a smell, a terrible smell on my bed, you know. And uh, I didn't know what it was, so I looked under the bed, and I saw this trap. I'd caught the rat in it like that. And what happened is he, he kind of, the trap cut the rat in half, you know, uh -huh. and uh, and he blew up on his side, you know, and so I reached in there to pull that rat out, and I got half a rat. <laughs> the other half stayed in the trap. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to get rid of that rat. It was huh. something. But, uh, we were, I guess, uh, one of the problems that I had, you know, at, at night what we used to do is to uh, because of the malaria, well, they had these bombs, they called them, uh, little, actually what they were, DDT. Mm -hmm. And what we would do is you'd tuck yourself in from the netting all around you uh -huh. and then spray the DDT and hold your breath while it settled down, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and then 
um, you wanted to keep uh, yourself uh, tight uh, around the thing because one of the problems people had is the rats would get in with you, you know, in the bed. And you know what they would do? They would lick you for the salt in your skin, you know. Oh. You know where they licked? Your heel. You, you know what they licked the heel? Uh -uh. Because you couldn't feel it. You see, if you lick you somewhere else, you wake you right up. Uh -huh. So lick, you know, I, there was one fellow, his heel was licked raw. And he, so, so I'm sleeping this night, and I felt some sensation. I kicked, and that rat ran up my leg and <laughs> jumped out. <laughs> How he got out, I don't know, but he, huh. he was gone. <laughs> Now, did you take Adabrin for the oh, malaria? Yes. Yeah. Did well, it turn your skin yellow? Yellow bellies. Uh -huh. right? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. And uh, I'm, uh, well, there was a, we had a radio man. He didn't take his Adabrin. He got malaria, and uh, he had those shakes. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't see him too much after that one or two times. Mm -hmm. He was a big fellow. He didn't like. He had hands like that. He was a wrestler. Mm -hmm. you know, Big fellow. I said next to him. He was a sergeant. I was a lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> now, were you overseas when President Roosevelt died? I think it was in uh, in April of '45. I must have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and were you were you there when uh, the war in Europe ended? I must have been. Mm -hmm. I must have been. Because the war that ended in May, I was uh, I'd flew my missions and was on the way home, and I got to uh, Karachi, India, mm -hmm. and I was there waiting to get a boat or transportation home, and the war ended. So that, that was with the uh, the war with Japan ended. Yes, the war with Japan ended. Okay, um, what about the dropping of the atomic bombs? Uh, were there any rumors about those bombs? No, uh, nothing. 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 We never had any news like that where we were. Mm -hmm. Did you find it hard to believe that one bomb could take out yes. an entire city? I, I couldn't believe it. I, then they dropped the second one. I still mm -hmm. couldn't believe that. But uh, it happened. I guess they just surrendered, so it must have been the truth. Mm -hmm. How did you get home? I came back on a, on a, a victory ship. Mm -hmm which uh, what they did is they were certain on top of the hatch <clears throat> and they uh, uh, cables held down to the top of the hatch uh, these uh, sheds and you could just uh, walk in there was that much space uh, from between the shed and the bunks on each side mm -hmm. And it was probably 12 feet by oh, 10 feet mm -hmm. was the shed, and they had and six fellows slept there. And uh, it just when when the sea got rough, <coughs> the water would splash over to the sheds, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, keep got to keep the doors closed. But uh, we went from India the Red Sea, across the Atlantic Ocean, and back to the States. Did you get sick at all, seasick? Sure. Sick in the dog. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, were there anyone else from your unit with you at that point? No, or? no I was like a, a lone fellow because I was the only fellow left. Mm -hmm. I was one of the first navigators up there and, mm -hmm. and the first one to go back home. And whereabouts did the ship land? In New York Harbor. Mm -hmm. Was there a lot of celebration? <laughs> no. No? No. No, they're just, just getting home. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody paid any attention. There's nothing. All right. And where, whereabouts were you released from? Did they send you to Fort Dix? Yes. Mm -hmm. I was to Fort Dix. And then, uh, no, come to think of it, somehow I was down in the Carolinas, um, I think for processing. Mm -hmm. I probably, I don't know, I didn't, I don't know how I got down there, but I know we came in on New York Harbor. Did you go home first for a leave and then uh, you processed out later? Probably that's what happened. I probably mm -hmm. went home for a leave and then had to go to Carolina, North Carolina. 
-hmm. and then uh, for processing or whatever it was, and then uh, came home. Mm -hmm. How much time did you spend overseas? Not long. I think it was about seven months mm -hmm. overseas because I flew so many missions. Mm -hmm. And the other fellow, my, my fellow I knew flew with quite a bit was Larry Tompkins, and he was from Oslo, New York. Mm -hmm. And he was in his sophomore year in college, too. So we had something in common. The, most of the other fellows were much older, you know. Uh, I was going to ask you, did you make use of the GI Bill? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's after the GI Bill. I went to Fordham, mm -hmm. New York City, for a while, and then I went to Albany Law School. Yeah. And what year did you graduate? I think it was 1949. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you practiced law at that, at that I, point. I became. I, I was uh, an attorney uh, for uh, the, the New York State Conference of Mayors. We represented the cities and villages in the state mm -hmm. and the legislature, and uh, were. So, source of educational information for municipal officials, mm -hmm. and I became general counsel uh, to the conference mayors. And, and then, just prior to my uh, retirement, I was temporarily executive director of the conference of mayors until they could uh, find somebody to replace me. Mm -hmm. And then, after that, I uh, became uh, counsel to the Commission on Rural Resources. Mm -hmm. in the New York State Senate, and I was there 20 years or thereabouts until I retired. Uh, uh, my demise came about mm -hmm. when there was a change in the political parties in the legislature. Now, were you uh, Justice of the Peace here in Castleton? I was a, town, a village attorney uh, here in Castleton. Mm -hmm. I was a attorney for the town of Skodak, an attorney for the uh, village, uh, attorney for the um, Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Skodak, mm -hmm. and also attorney for the Skodak Central School District for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. So you had a, a very busy life, it sounds well, like. Yes, it was interesting. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations? Yeah, I joined the American Legion and then the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Mm -hmm. The American Legion went out of business here in Castleton, I guess, a lack of members. So I was a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars in Castleton. Are you an active member today? Not a very active one, but a, a, I'm still there. Mm -hmm. I pay my annual dues to support the organization. I do too. <laughs> seldom attend. Um, <clears throat> have you attended any reunions at all? Uh, no. Um, I didn't meet with my pilot. Mm -hmm. He was um, in uh, Oil City, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I, I joined the CBI organization, mm -hmm. and they put out a book uh, of all the members, and I got this telephone call, and this fellow says, hey, Don Walsh, yes, he said, do you remember me? I says, no. He says, Larry Tompkins, first combat cargo. Well, I had to go see him, uh -huh. and so my wife and I, we drove down to Oil City to see him, and Larry had a, a bad leg. Uh, he was uh, in a wheelchair, uh -huh. and couldn't get around too well. Uh, eventually, uh, they took his leg off, and uh, he died about four months ago. Oh. He was a nice fellow. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of time together. It was a really nice friendship. I used mm -hmm. to call him every so often when he was in the VA hospital, and uh, he was, I was his outside source of information. Mm -hmm. What about the other members of your crew? I didn't know. Remember them? Mm -hmm. I couldn't. I couldn't tell you who who, who they were. Uh, there's a picture over there of Larry Tompkins. Uh huh. And, uh, but uh, other than that, uh, I didn't have any contact with anybody. I tried to call somebody who was uh, in this area, First Combat Cargo, but they never called me back. No. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Well, it was a, you know, you had to make, you had to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I can remember we were flying along in, in the dark. And uh, uh, I couldn't see the ground. I couldn't see the sky. It was solid, socked in. Mm -hmm. So I fixed the astral compass of where I thought Polaris should be. And that plane was going back and forth and back and forth. And finally, uh, I saw a star. It was almost certain it had to be Polaris. Mm -hmm. And I got a bearing on it. 
Well, I went and plotted it, and it seemed that we were way north, of course, and um, the mountains ahead of our, we were flying at about 18,000 feet, something like that, less than that, because we were, uh, weren't on oxygen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were flying, and those peaks were ahead of us. So I called the pilot, and I said, I want you to do a, a 90 degree turn to the left. I want you to hold that for 30, 40 minutes, 40 minutes it was, and I want you to take a 90 degrees to the right. So we went up in the air, mm -hmm. and uh, when we came that distance, our radar was able to pick up the base, and we were dead ahead. So that showed that we were way off course and headed for those mountains. Mm. Now the point I wanted to make is, when it's up to you to make a decision. And so you could make those decisions. That was one of the things I think in life you had to do, make those decisions yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, that's how I managed, I think. Okay. Is there anything else uh, you'd like to touch on that maybe we missed? I can't think of anything. Did you uh, ever get to see any sort of USO shows? or? Oh, yes. They were great. Mm -hmm. and I made a contribution not too long ago to the U.S. shows presently. Mm -hmm. And because it was kind of a home, something home mm -hmm. that you never experienced, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was nice to know that you weren't just isolated, but there were people home mm -hmm. who thought of you. you know? Did you receive letters regularly from home? I got letters from my mother. Mm -hmm. I had a brother who used to write to me, but uh, he was killed during the war. Oh. Mm -hmm. What was... Was he in the army, or he was in the army? He was with the 104th Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you never Timberwolf Division. It was called. Oh yes, and um, he was um, he was in college, mm -hmm. just like the rest of us. I don't know what they call an ASTP program, mm -hmm. where they taught kids. And when they landed in Europe, uh, D-Day came, and taking a lot of losses on the infantry. They called up all those AST boys and put him in the infantry. And uh, so John went over and uh, uh, his buddies told me that he was, they were fighting in Aachen. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was a major city of Germany that mm -hmm. Hitler wanted to keep at all costs. And uh, his buddies told me that they were fighting from room to room, you know, lobbing hand grenades over the partitions and everything. And um, then they made a river crossing at some time later called the Maas River. And they were going to, um, apparently they decided that uh, you do it without, uh, without artillery support. Mm -hmm. And they went in rubber boats across the river. The Germans were waiting for them. And uh, I think 12 out of 160 or so got back. The rest of them were all killed. John was one of them. The last letter I got from John is you can't say where you are or anything sure. or what you're doing. But he wrote me a letter. He says, my favorite weapon is the bayonet. Hmm. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Okay. Okay. You said your brother went to Manhattan College? Yes. And that's him in the center? Right. He was 13th in the country on cross-country championship on IC4A. Okay. Now, are your parents in that picture too? Yes. Okay, that's your dad? Yes. And your mom? Right, and John, and then my aunt, Aunt Marie, and my brother, my older brother. Okay. okay. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, your, your parents are on the on the right hand side right. of the photo. Okay. All right. And you have a photograph of yourself? How about that? <laughs> and uh, when was that taken? When I came home. Okay. I was home after the war. And you received the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal? Uh, yeah, three Air Medals. Three Air Medals. Three battle stars. Okay. All right.
Thank you so much. Very good.